So can you first describe the focus of your original training as a physician and what led you to become one of the initial ambassadors in complementary and integrative medicine? I'd be happy to. Um, that journey began way before medical school for me. Um, I was uh, a child who grew up um, going to my father's bakery in Brooklyn on weekends, learning to cook and bake before I could read or write or throw a baseball and fell in love with food um, and cooking. My dad tragically died when I was 10 and he was 39. And all my grandparents died the same year of unrelated acute diseases. The custom in the 60s was not to discuss any of that. And I, I decided I wanted to become a doctor, if only to understand what had happened. Fast forward a few years, at the end of high school for me, Nixon was opening up China. And this is really a story of how, you know, unintended consequences happen in life. Mm -hmm. When Nixon opened up China, he sent Henry Kissinger ahead to explore the rapprochement with Beijing. The New York Times sent a reporter to follow Henry Kissinger. This is 1971. And that New York Times reporter, James Reston, developed appendicitis, was operated on, and had pain three days after his operation. And he wrote about it on the front page of the New York Times, writing a tongue-in-cheek obituary to his appendix. He said, the pain was obliterated by two skinny needles, one in his kneecap and one in his elbow. It was the first report of acupuncture, anesthesia, and Chinese medicine to reach the West. I was stupefied. Mm -hmm. I was 16 years old. So as I entered Harvard College, I asked to do an independent study on Chinese medicine. Found very little in English because there had been no communication with Beijing for almost 30, 40 years. But there was a translation of the basic tests of text of Asian medicine, the Yellow Emperor's classic, that said, prevention is always superior to intervention, always. And the way we eat and move and think or control our thoughts impacts our health and gives us our recuperative capacity. It changed my life. Mm -hmm. So before I went to college, let alone medical school, <clears throat> I was intent in I wanted to understand if this approach to health and wellness and prevention and disease management had anything to teach us. So I studied Chinese while I was a pre-medical student. I then went to Harvard Medical School. <clears throat> and before I graduated, we normalized relations with China. And then the then Dean of Students, Dan Fetterman, called me in my junior year and said, National Academy of Sciences is looking for the first dozen scholars to go to China since 1949. You should apply. So I did. There were two finalists for the medical slot. The other finalist was Ted Kapchuk. <laughs> That's how I met Ted in 1979. And I really thought they would pick him because he had lived in Macau. He was an expert of Chinese medicine. They picked me. We have been brothers from another mother ever since. So I went to China. I was exposed to Chinese medicine. It, it really opened my eyes to all these other therapies. <clears throat> and then when I came back, um, my tough love mentors who didn't necessarily believe in any of those treatments believed in the application of science to figure out which worked, how they might work. And they shared the fascination with me and Ted in the question of how our belief expectation or the context of a treatment <clears throat> can increase or decrease the effect of any therapy. That was the beginning. 